How are you this morning? It's a beautiful day. And the only thing that makes it truly beautiful is the fact that it's the day that the Lord has made, right? So we need to rejoice and be glad in it, whether it's cloudy, rainy, colder than I like for it to be or whatever. It's a day God has made, and let's rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, for those of you who I didn't uh, shake your hand or whatever this morning, here's a fist bump to you. Come on, give her here. I'm not shaking your hand on the way out either. You people make me sick. <laughs> <clears throat> Whew. I'm tired of this junk. It's from here to here, and it just won't go away. But anyway, it's good to see you this morning. So when we leave today, we're going to do this too. I'm staying here, you're staying there, and you're leaving. And I love you. I love you. But it's good to see you this week. Um, I hope you've had a good week. If you haven't, why? Anybody want to share why you haven't had a good week? Okay. You know, even in the bad times, we're told that we can rejoice, right? And I want to encourage you when things start getting rough, when you start getting to where you feel like crud, uh, you know, as the scripture says in everything, give thanks. Learn to give thanks even when you're not feeling well. It'll change your outlook. It'll change your attitude. Uh, it'll change your perspective on life. And I know that everybody in here goes through different things. I know some of you are struggling with this, that, or the other, and I get it. I understand. But I also get the fact that God is good. And not today, but the next time I speak, we're going to be looking at some of the things. You know, we put God in a box. We really do. And we think that God should perform the way that we think that he should perform. But you got to remember, he's God. I'm not, you're not, but he is. So as we're going through these questions, uh, Q&A, if you're a guest here today, thank you for joining with us. What we did last month is we had people to send in their questions that they would like for us to try to answer, and we can't answer all of them. We can give you what we think. And I tell you all the time, be careful. If I give you my opinion, it's just that, right? You can't build doctrine. You can't build theology. You can't tell somebody they're wrong based upon my opinion. I have an opinion as I look at Scripture and I try to break it down and try to make the whole, you know, instead of one verse, taking a verse out of context or this proof texting where you take one verse and you make it say what you want it to say and then say, blame God for it. I don't ever want to do that. It doesn't mean I haven't done it before. But I don't want to do that. And so we look and we break down the whole. And when I break down the whole, I see that God is in control. But even though he's in control, and again, we'll talk about this more next time, I can't wait to get into that, but I had to set it up because the question this week is, is this. It's a question, and it's got a couple of comments in it. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to treat this as three separate teaching times, okay, instead of just trying to answer it all at once because I don't have time. There's no way I could do it. But this week's question, and before I read the question, I want you to know something. I don't know who sent this one in. Several of them, the last week, I didn't know who sent the one in last week about baptism. And uh, so as I taught on it, and as I, as I spoke on it, then later on in the week, I, or maybe that day, I can't remember, I get a text that, hey, that was my question, thanks, uh, I want to be baptized. I think that's awesome. So here's the thing. If somebody put their name on it, I won't tell you who did, but I'll say this had a name on it. This one didn't. So here, you're probably sitting in here this morning. If not, you're watching it on Facebook Live. If I say something that makes your feathers ruffle, I don't know who you are. <laughs> don't take it personal. I'm treating the question just like it came in from, well, I guess it did. It came in from outer space because it came in on the Internet. I think it flows through something or something. I don't know how that works exactly. But seriously, have you ever been in church and a preacher talking about something and you felt like he was talking right to you? And then sometimes you wanted to get frustrated and upset. He had no clue it was you, probably. You'd be surprised what we do know about y'all. But, <laughs> but probably he had no clue. So last week we did talk about do we sprinkle or do we immerse. And just a quick rundown, the reason we immerse is because we feel like that's what's written in the Scripture. The only time sprinkling is taught anywhere in the scriptures in the Old Testament, talking about the sprinkling of blood on altars and different things like that. So the word sprinkle is there. If I said it's not, it is there. But not to do with baptism the way we practice it today. And why, do we be, why are we baptized? Because Jesus told us to be. That's why. 
We saw that it's not for salvation. Scripture is very clear. Even though there's two or three verses taken out of context or words misunderstood can lead us to believe that that, uh, baptism is is, uh, essential for salvation, the whole of Scripture teaches that it's not. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So why be baptized? Because Jesus said to. And so it's obedience more than anything, right? We don't have to totally understand it. If Jesus tells me to walk across the street and I'm going to be obedient, guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to say, but Lord, there's traffic coming. He's probably going to say, well, use your brain and know when to go. (laughs) He's going to tell me as a kid you played Frogger, so you know how to do that and how to jump out of the way. But if he says go, we need to go. But what we do is we sit back and make all kinds of excuses as to why we shouldn't go. But obedience is doing what you're told, when you're told, with the right heart attitude. And by the way, God knows your heart. So that was last week. Here's this week's question and comment, and I'll tell you how we're going to break it down. Since God has already decided how to answer any situation, that's the one we're answering next time. Got a lot for that. But since God has already decided how to answer any situation, why should we pray for requests? This came after Kim a couple, three weeks ago got up, said you need to go online and uh, go over the prayer requests and be praying for those people. Why should we pray for requests? We could possibly be praying for the opposite of what God is going to do. And that is bad to not pray God's will. So there's a lot going on in that question and that comment. And again, whoever sent that in, I have no clue who you are. So please, uh, don't take anything. But we're going to use scripture to back up why we do what we do. Okay? Turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 55. For those of you who don't know, you can get online and you can go to notes on our website, go down, scroll down to notes, push that, and all my scripture and all, not all my notes, but some of my notes will pop up on that, and you can follow along that way if you'd like. Since God has already decided how to answer any situation, we're going to hit that section next time. Today we're going to talk about why should we pray for requests, and then secondly, the comment we could possibly be praying for the opposite of what God is going to do And that is bad to not pray God's will. But here's something we have to understand. I've already hit on it just a little bit. But we have to understand this. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9 should help us to understand something very clearly. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. You you picking up what he's putting down there? He says, his thoughts are not our thoughts. He says, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth... So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He's an infinite God, right? We're finite people. I think the smartest, correct me, I don't even know what the numbers are, but it seems like the smartest person in the world only uses a small percentage of their brain capacity. We don't use it all. Some of you, it's obvious. But we don't, we don't use it all. I can't help it. Uh, Oh, I'm talking to me, too. But God is even beyond what we can imagine or think, right? And, and when we truly understand that, I think it'll help us to understand a lot, th- a lot of things more clearly, even with what we're talking about today. Why, first part, why should we pray for prayer requests? Why, when you say, I want you to pray for me, why should we pray for you? You know, many times, and this went on to say, this question and comment went on to say, you know, sometimes it just becomes gossip sessions. And I'm telling you what, prayer time can become a gossip session. Can you believe they're praying for that? I wonder what's going on in their life. I bet he's cheating again. What do you think? I don't know. I don't know why he, it could have been her. Uh, did you hear about their teenage daughter? <gasps> no, What? Like we really are concerned but what it is, we really want to know, right? You know what I'm talking about. So we do have to be careful. If somebody says, I want you to pray for something, then you need to pray for that. And then you need to ask them, and this is what I'm learning to ask, do you want me to get other people to pray? And if they say, no, I'd just like to keep it between us, guess what you need to do? Don't run out and say, well, bless God, I'm going to get as many people praying because they don't know what they're saying. No, they've asked you not to. 
those are when things become gossip sessions and stuff, and we have to be very, very careful. But Isaiah 55, God is saying very clearly that his thoughts are way above our thoughts. And God lives outside of this thing called time, outside of the realm of time. He is not constricted to time, and he's also not constricted to what we are constricted to. You know, we have, we have laws that says, gravity says you can't jump. If you do jump, what's going to happen? It's going to splat. We have laws that says you got to breathe. If you don't breathe, what's going to happen? You're going to die. We have all these laws, but guess who set the laws in motion? Who? God. But he's not held accountable to the things he sets for us. Because he's God, right? Now, there are things we know about God. He's love, right? He is love. He's the very essence of love. That doesn't mean that love is God, but God is love. So anything that looks like he's not doing it in a loving way, and, but, and then you look all throughout the Old Testament, you see him just wiping people out. Well, how can that be loving? We're going to get into all that next time. Because there's a lot of teaching there, and there's a lot of depth there, and it may take me two or three weeks to get through that one. And I'm okay with that. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Why should we pray for requests? We have to understand that God's in control. He's bigger than us, but there are some things he tells us to do, okay? He tells me to be baptized. Why? It has nothing to do with salvation. Why do I need to be baptized? Because he said, what? Be baptized. Who am I to question him on that? You know, we're told, and I think it's in Romans, that the clay is not to, supposed to be questioning the potter. Why are you making me this way? Because he wants to and because he can and because he's got a purpose, right? And if we could realize that about ourselves, a lot of things would come more natural and, and our worship would come more freely and our obedience would be more, we just couldn't wait to obey. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? You don't know what I'm thinking right now. Do you? Those people on the 800 numbers don't know what you're thinking. Do they? I know there's probably, and I don't know who you are. Don't have a clue, because if I did, I'd probably come and talk to you. But I'm sure there's somebody sitting in here who... who May listen to that, thinking there's truth into it. No, there's not. I say this often, you know, it's funny that you watch it on TV about calling Sister or Jane or whatever her name is, and, and uh, then down in fine print it says, for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> you ever notice that? Well, we know why they put that there. In case you follow their advice and you go do something stupid, you can't sue them. That's why they put that there. But if they knew what they were doing was right, they would say, I'm not putting that there because I know what they're thinking or I know what their future holds and I'm going to stand upon it, right? Anyway. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? Hopefully you know what you're thinking. The spirit within you knows what you're thinking. And so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We've already been told his thoughts are way above ours, right? I cannot comprehend the thoughts of God. I can only comprehend what he, through his spirit, allows me to know. And beyond that, I can't be speaking for God. I just can't. Yes, we're to be a mouthpiece for him, but what we have is the spirit living within us who's taken the word of God, which we have readily at our fingertips, why it's so important for us to be studying for ourselves, and God will use his spirit through his word to teach us what he wants us to know and tell us what he wants us to tell. Does that make sense? Verse 12, he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. He's not saying we will know everything about God. He's not saying we'll know everything about the mind of God and how God thinks, but that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. So when God gives me something with His Spirit who lives within me as a child of God, and remember, every believer who is, has ever lived, if they're truly a, a follower of Jesus Christ, they place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God living within you. That's what the scripture teaches. He's the one that convicts. He's the one that teaches. He's the one that leads. He's the one that corrects. He's the one that rebukes. And, and so we have to trust that. 
But Paul is still saying he gives us and helps us understand the things that God freely gives to us. So we don't have to be totally ignorant of God. We don't have to be totally ignorant of what he has for us and what he desires for us. But there's a lot of things about God that we just will never know until we're in his presence. Because if I'm only thinking with, I don't know, 3 or 4% of my brain, and I may be giving myself credit there, and God's all-knowing, he's all-perfect, oh, he's all-knowing, so then he must know. See, here we go again. We're putting God back in a box. We're going to hit on that next time. I can't wait. I really want to get into it right now, but I can't. But that's important to understand that reasoning. Because here's what we do many times. We say, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Correct. His ways are not our ways. They're much higher and deeper than ours. Absolutely. God knows everything. I believe that. But by me saying I believe that God knows everything, when I start saying, well, then, then there's no reason to pray because God already knows what's going to happen, I'm putting God in a box. How do I know what God desires to know? Right? talk about that next time. <laughs> so why should we pray for people's requests? Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord how often? Always. Always. Again, I will say rejoice. I don't care what you're going through, you can rejoice in the Lord if you know him, right? Yes. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, because anxiety turns into stress and worry, right? And we're not supposed to worry about tomorrow. Jesus told us in Matthew uh, 6, I believe it is. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough on its own plate. You get into today and live for today. So do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. How, by what? Everything. By how much? Everything. What does everything mean? Everything. It means Everything. You know, some words just speak for themselves. So do not be anxious. Do not be stressing. Do not be freaking out about anything. What does anything mean? It means anything. But in everything, by what? By what? Prayer. Prayer. What is prayer? It's simply talking to God. That's what it is. Don't try to make it more than what it is, and don't try to make it less than what it is. It's simply talking to God. And in God's word, and if I believe Philippians, that, that Paul was, was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write these words, and I'm going to trust that they're from God. And I trust that everything that we have in the scripture is from God. That God took men and he said, here's what I want you to write. I'm going to let you write it in your own words, but here's what I want you to write. And I think we have the words of God, but we don't have them all, right? He's given us what he wants to give us. He's allowed us to have what he thinks we need to have right now. So don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, by talking to God, by communing with God, by prayer and supplication, that means really getting in it. God, this is what I want. I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm serious. I really want you to, to hear me, and I really want you to do this. I want you to heal. I want you to, to provide whatever, and just really get into to it. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Go ahead and thank him. And you may not get what you're asking for, but we're still supposed to be thankful, right? So if I ask God for something and I don't get it, how in the world can I be thankful for that? Because he knows whether I needed it or not. He knows whether I'm going to take it and use it for his glory and his honor, if I'm going to use it for my own. God does say no. Parents, how many of you ever said no to your children? You mean old people. That's all you are, just, aren't they? They're just all mean. How dare them to squelch what you and all your infinite wisdom know to be best for you. But you say no many times. Let's take off the meanness part. Let's take off the fact that you say no about everything. And I know some of y'all have parents like that. <laughs> Mama, can I know? <laughs> but you don't even know what? No. I'm tired of you asking for stuff. No. That's not the God we serve. He still says, bring your request. Let your request be made known. 
with thanksgiving, let your request be made known. So to me, that tells me that my Heavenly Father is willing to listen. But understand, if I trust Him, I've got to understand that He may say no. And I don't need to go pouting and getting over in the corner and kicking and throwing a temper tantrum. Because I can't be throwing a temper tantrum and and just being all frustrated and be thankful at the same time, can I? Can I? Try it sometime. When you feel like you're just, when you're just ready to explode on your parents, stop and thank God for them. And it'll change the explosion if you're sincere. It really will. If you've just prayed that, that God would let you have that brand new car that you know you can't afford, you're just like, why do you always go there? <laughs> Maybe I deal with it every now and then. But you pray for it, and then you go, and you're all excited, and there's nothing like driving a brand new vehicle. You open the door, and it just smells good. You shut the door, and it just goes, thump. You know, it don't go, (laughs) it will in a few months. You look at the beautiful paint, and it's amazing how clean they keep them. I wonder why they do that. Because it's appealing to your eyes. No scratches, no dents. How many of you have a dent in your vehicle? How many of you have scratches on your vehicle? How many of your vehicle doesn't smell as good as it did when you first bought it? Mm-hmm. And then for those reasons, many times we're ready to get a new one because we fall in love with that. But we say, God, I want it, and you, please let me have it. And it's okay to ask for because he tells us to ask, right? But he may say or maybe trying to get your attention to let you know that, number one, you can't afford it. Number two, if you can afford the payments, you may not be able to afford the insurance. Number three, the one you got is just fine and it's paid for. Why don't you enjoy it and use that money to bring glory and honor to him? Use it to help somebody else. Huh? I don't think there's anything wrong with having a new car. Well, I do think there's some things wrong with it. If you can get an interest-free loan, it's better. Uh, you know, but, but I'm not talking about whether you have a new car or not. What I'm talking about is praying and asking God for it, then knowing that you can't afford it. Then when you get there, they say, well, you know, your credit's not the greatest, but hey, here's what we can do for you. They're getting ready to cost you more money. (laughs) If they could say, oh, you've got a zero credit rating, but hey, we can make this happen. (laughs) Run. But what we do is say, oh, bless God, he's answering my prayer. He's going to make a way for this to happen. No, the Spirit may be inside of you saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And because that person sitting across from you says, we can make this happen. Yes, God, in everything, give thanks. I want to thank you. And then in no time at all, there's quarreling amongst you. Well, I didn't want the stinking new car. Well, you did. Too. No, I didn't. And then next thing you know, there's all, y'all can't have any new shoes. Mom and dad spent all the money on a new car. Which is more important? The car. But words will say you are, but the car. And so God is trying to tell you no because wisdom says you can't. Maybe later, maybe when you get things in order. But we go do it anyway, and then we wonder why. But God, you told me I could have it. And he said, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I don't like you being in debt. I certainly don't like you being in debt for things that, that you buy and you pay way too much for, and when you get down to here, it's not worth anything. Isn't that amazing how cars do that? But then when you go to the lot, you got to pay for it again. You ever thought about that? That's just the weirdest thing. And I, sometimes I sit around and think crazy things, and I'm looking at my used car, and I'm thinking, I wonder how much money has really been spent on that car. Because if somebody bought it and they paid for it, that chunk's been spent on it. Then they trade it in, and the car dealer sells it to somebody else or trades it to somebody else. Then they pay for it, and then sucker me comes along, and I pay for it, and then I'm going to sell it to somebody else someday maybe. I don't know at my age. It may be the last car I ever own, and that's okay. That was a long way to go about saying, talking about prayer. Sometimes we pray, and the answer is not what we want it to be, but yet we make it happen because we can. And then we wonder why God's blessings are not upon it. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer. God is telling us in his word to pray. Why should I pray for your request? Because God's word is telling me to. You know, even with the disciples in Luke, uh, they came up to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he taught them how to pray. Not to give them a rogue prayer, but, you know, bring praise to God, trust God, trust his will. We do want God's will to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. But do you know for sure what God's will is in every circumstance? Do you? The only thing I can tell you that I think is God's will that I know for sure is he's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Jesus died for how many people? And, and he's saying, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that it's God's will for everyone to be saved. But apparently, God doesn't force his will. He puts it out there. This is my will. You want to go to heaven? You follow my will. You want to have peace in your life and joy in your life? You follow my will. You want to not be a, a slave to the lender? Follow my will on finances. I can teach you all these things. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then it says, look this, and I love this. I love this part. And the peace of God. I don't know about you. I want the peace of God. But life gets in the way, doesn't it? But God's word is telling me that I can have the peace of God. And that peace of God passes all understanding. I don't get it. How can you have the peace of God when life's falling apart around you? You trust in him. You're giving thanks even though your life's falling apart around you. You're saying, okay, Holy Spirit, show me what it is that I need to do to, to, to make this not work the way it's working. And he may just simply say, learn to give thanks because it's still going to fall apart. We look at Job, righteous man. Would you say his life started falling apart? And God knew it too, didn't he? Because God was allowing it to happen, right? But even in what God was allowing, he was telling Satan, you can only do so much. You can only do what I allow you to do. And so it looks like there that God's got everything in control and he's moving every little piece and he's making every little thing happen. We're going to talk about that next time. But the peace of God, which passes all understanding, that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Life can be falling apart, but you can have the peace of God that passes all understanding, and it will guard your heart and your mind. But you've got to let it. In James chapter 5, we're told that, I don't have it on, on things, I'm just, things are popping into my brain. It talks about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's talking about the person who doesn't give up. They're fervent in their praying. In James, we're told to pray for one another that you may be healed. Okay, if I'm told to pray for you that you may be healed, does God have the last word in that? But through his word, he's telling me to pray for you. That's why I pray for you. That's why we do prayer requests, because God's word tells us to. And I'll be honest with you, I... There, I see a whole lot more of my prayers that I don't see answered to the affirmative. I see a whole lot more of that than I do prayers where God says, yes, 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 yes. God, I love you. Can I ask what I want? Yes. Do I get everything I ask for? No. Why? Because I love you. Tell that to the little kid. Mama said no because I love you. Mama used to whack me because I love you. It hurts. Don't love me so much, Mama. Satan would love for us to stop talking to the Father. And we come along sometimes with these notions. And here's what I'm going to say. If you can read th through the whole Scripture, and you can see in the whole Scripture we're told to pray, and we're told to, to, to pray for other people. And we're told to let our requests be made known to God. It's throughout all of Scripture. What should I be doing? Praying. praying. That's why we pray. The Bible talks about faith. I think when you pray, you should pray with faith. If I pray believing that God is not going to make it happen, oh, but wait, he knows everything, so he's already got it figured out. We'll talk about that next time. Because it's real. 
Because we put God in a box in our way of thinking because we've got this little bit of our brain that we think with. And we think God thinks like that. No, his thoughts are much higher than our thoughts, right? And when he says no, it's because he knows why you don't need it. When he says yes, he knows that he can trust you with it maybe. When he says wait, maybe there's some things that still have to happen before that can come to, come to pass. I don't know. But we have to trust him. James chapter 4, verse 2 says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet, you want something so badly, and you cannot obtain it, so you fight and quarrel. You know, jealousy kicks in, envy kicks in. Well, they've got this and I don't. Well, maybe they worked harder for it, or maybe they're more in debt, and maybe you ought to be thankful that you're not up to here getting ready to lose everything. You know, a lot of people, it's not what you see, right? Right? Everybody, and there's nothing wrong. I'm not dogging you if you got a nice house and, and a five-car garage. I'm, I'm not. God bless you. I hope you're using it to bring glory and honor to God. I really do. But just because you see somebody driving something nice doesn't mean they've got their finances together. Right? Just because you see somebody that looks like everything's just perfect in their life does not mean that everything's just perfect in their life. We know how to put on a show, don't we? Put on a face. But James is saying you desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, you want something so badly, but you cannot obtain it, so you fight and quarrel over it. But then he goes on, you do not have because you do not ask. You didn't pray. You didn't seek God on it. Then he says in verse 3, you do ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly. So I guess there's a wrong way to pray. God, you know I hate that person. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help me get them back. I don't think that one's going to be answered. I'm pretty sure it's not. God, they've got a much nicer home than I do, and I work hard. How come I don't have that? Here we go, coveting other people's stuff. And that's all through Scripture that we're not to. You need to be thankful for what you've got. Why should God give you that when you're not thankful for this? Huh? You ever stop to think about that? Some of you kids, you're going to drive beaters for a while. Just be thankful you got... Uh, that's an old junk car. Just be, thankful, <laughs> just be thankful you've got something to get you from point A to point B. But they'll laugh at me. Who cares? Laugh with them. <laughs> yeah, it's a piece of junk. But I'm thankful for it. I don't owe anything on it. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for giving me this piece of junk that drives... I don't mean to keep looking at y'all when I talk about it. <laughs> they got a slew of cars coming in their future. A slew of cars coming in that future. But when we learn to be thankful for what we have, then we learn not to covet what somebody else has. I don't want their headache. I want my peace of mind. I don't want their payment. I want whatever comes in, I can use it to do whatever I want to for God's glory and His honor. I can do with it whatever I want to, but we should be using it for God's glory and His honor, right? It says you, do, you, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You become very selfish. We live in a very selfish society. We want what we want, when we want it, no matter who gets killed. And oh, by the way, God, I want you to pour a little bit of sprinkling of blessings on it. I want it to last. I've got a car sitting under my carport that we bought, oh, I don't know, two and a half months ago now. <laughs> it's been in two garages. She's yet to drive it to work. That's your work car. <laughs> and she'll look at me every now and say, honey, God's got this under control. I say, I know, I know. <laughs> and it's going to run one day. <laughs> I can get all bent out of shape. You say, didn't you drive it before you bought it? Yep. <laughs> Did it run? Yep. It was two days later that I was going to go put her some new tires on it so she'd be all excited. She didn't know. See, I can't surprise her with anything because in when, she, when I buy something with our credit card, which we pay at the end of the month, by the way, I don't mind saying that, but when I buy it, it immediately dings her and lets her know there's something going on. Tell them why. Because you, did something. you don't trust me. <laughs> That's why. Honey, let that go. That was in our first year of marriage, 33 years ago. Whoo, 
You're talking about holding a grudge. I'll tell you the story. Maybe you Yeah, ask her on the way out and then ask me. So anyway, I had, had some my golf money saved up in my hiding place, and I was going to surprise her, so I go out to start the car, and <laughs> that's how it's been running ever since. God will provide. Seriously, he will. I've got a couple friends who are saying, here, let's try this, let's do this, okay. Uh, you know, and I hope that works. If it doesn't, then I will take it and spend more money on it. Lord, thank you for the truck and the car we do have. She gets to work. Thank you. If we didn't have that, I'd call some of you guys. You get a ride? Can I borrow your vehicle? Hey. Anyway, we pray because we're told to pray. That's why we pray. It's all through Scripture. Pray. Ask God. That's why we pray. We're told all through Scripture to pray for one another, right? Right? We're told all through Scripture to lift one another up in prayer to God. We're told to do that. That's why we do it. You may never get a prayer answered in the affirmative. And you, you may say, but I'm walking, the best I know, I'm walking in the Spirit. I'm walking in God's will. I don't know what else to do. Then thank God that He's protecting you from something. That's how we have to learn to do things. We learn early that no is a terrible word. But many times, no protects us from something that we don't need. In the second part of that, why do we pray? Why do we pray? You have to answer that. Why do we pray? God's Word tells us to. Why do we, why do we pray for one another's requests? Why? You've got to catch this. Because God's Word tells us to. Well, that's just not enough. I don't know what else to give you. Is it not enough that all you have to do is place your faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and you'll spend eternity in heaven? I can't tell you anything beyond that to get you into heaven. So if it's not enough that we pray because God tells us to pray, I guess we could say it's not enough to believe by faith in Jesus that's going to get me to heaven. Because I either believe it all or I don't believe any of it. And I choose to believe it all and it's changed my life. And I tell you this all the time, if I die and I don't go to heaven because there is no heaven, I've died with peace. I've died with joy. I've died being able to love a little bit more than I normally would be able to. But the scripture says that's what's going to happen. And I trust it. So why am I going to pray for your request? Because God's word tells me to. Listen, if God's word tells me to and I'm not doing it, I'm being what? Disobedient. And I'm probably going to go through life miserable because I'm not communicating with God the way He's... Well, I worship Him and praise Him all the time. Well, that's fine. You should. We're told to. That should be where we start. Before you ask for anything, you ought to spend a little time in praise and worship. But if I can't believe that I can ask God requests for you, then what makes me believe that He's hearing my prayers and my praise when I worship Him and thank Him for things? You see what I'm saying? So whoever wrote this in, you need to try it. Somewhere along the way, you've either not had th something answered or somebody has told you something, and be careful what you listen to with people who are not using the whole counsel of the Word of God. You can make it say anything. And Satan uses people. Satan uses people called preachers. To scatter the sheep. To keep you beat down. Then it goes on to say we could possibly be praying for the opposite of what God is going to do. That's taken in mind that God has already got, a, got the answer set up. He's already got the situation worked out. And that's going to happen no matter what. We'll talk about that next time. But we could possibly be praying for the opposite of what God is going to do. And that is bad to not pray God's will. I understand what the person is saying. If I think that God's got a will, nothing can change it, why should I pray? He tells me to pray. What good's it going to do to pray? Because He tells me to. And I'm going to trust Him. Well, God cannot and won't and does not and will not and shall not and can't and all those things change His mind. We'll talk about that next time. And I want you to be here. 
So is it possible that uh, we, I mean, should we not pray because it may be opposite of what God wants us to, wants to happen? Well, let's look at some ex- examples. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to quickly go through these. Would you say the Apostle Paul probably was a man of God? Yes. Would you? Probably real close, right? Yes. God used him in a mighty way. In fact, Jesus made himself uh, known to him in a really crazy, what we think would be crazy, but God had a specific plan for Paul. And Paul was going to be one of the greatest evangelists, maybe the greatest to ever live. So here's a man that God used, and Paul prayed for other people often, didn't he? He prayed for things, and life, you know, people were healed, and, and all these crazy things took place because God used Paul. Paul prayed for people, and we can say it would have happened without his prayer. God tells us to pray. What if it doesn't happen if we don't pray? It doesn't make God any less God. Anyway, so 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, nobody knows for sure what that thorn was. We can all speculate, but we don't know for sure. There are those who will tell you they know for sure. That's fine. I don't know what it was, but it was something, right? Paul is saying a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. To me, that sounds spiritual. To keep me from becoming conceited. Three times. You see, Paul had all this God-given power from the Holy Spirit, right? And it would have been easy for Paul to say, look at me, look what I can do. Look at the power that I have. But remember, we talked about last week, Paul said, don't don't be saying you're a follower of mine. You need to be a follower of Christ. I'm just an instrument. I'm just a tool. All praise goes to God. All glory and honor goes to God. But look what he said in verse 8. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, about what? About this thorn in the flesh, that it would leave me. Three times. Here's a man of God who is seeing other people healed. Uh, He's seeing God use him in tremendous ways, but he's got this thorn in the flesh to keep him from becoming conceited, and he's prayed three times, God, take it away from me. Make it leave. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more, Paul's saying, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. There is a wonderful thing. You know I say it all the time. It's my favorite word. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses. How in the world can you be content with weaknesses? You know that God's in control. And you've learned how to give thanks even in those weaknesses. That's how you can be content. I'm content with weaknesses. With insults. Did he ever get any insults? Yeah. With hardships, did Paul have a hard life? Read the story about him. Read his life, yes. Persecutions, he was persecuted all the time for doing good. It's the last time you got persecuted for doing good. And I'm not talking about somebody who laughed at you on Facebook. I'm not talking about somebody sent out a tweet, right? Tweet about you. I'm not talking about that. He had persecutions. People were trying to kill him. People left him for dead shipwreck, all these things, and calamities. He says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. What's the point of this? Paul prayed three times. Now, was he praying against God's will? Apparently, because God was not going to take this thorn away from him. But he continued praying. Why? Because he knew God instructed him to teach us to pray. About what? About everything. How do we pray about everything? With thanksgiving. So Paul knew, even though, okay, here's number three, Lord, I'm coming back to you. And finally God says, no. No, because my grace is sufficient for you. It's going to be in your weakness that you're made strong. You're going to be a witness and a testimony to my goodness. And so Paul says, I'm going to be content with that. I don't know if Paul ever prayed about it again or not. We're not told that he did. But here's the thing. He prayed three times. And he prayed until he finally heard no. And he said, I'm content with that. But he prayed, right? 
And apparently it was God's will for this, these, this thorn to remain in his flesh. But he still prayed. That's why we pray. If I'm praying against God's will and God has firmly said in his mind how he, or however he does this, does this, if he's firmly said that's not going to happen, I can pray all I want to. But the key is that I pray with thanksgiving. I pray content knowing that I may not get what I ask for. But I'm told to still do what? Pray. pray. It's all through the Scripture. It's not some preacher telling you this. It's the Scripture telling you this. So that's why we pray. But what if it's God's will? You let God take care of that. Many times we don't have because we don't ask. If you're not asking, there's a good chance you're not getting. Right? Okay. And quickly, and i got to go quickly. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to get a real good example. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 36. Jesus is in the garden knowing he's getting ready to go be, to go be crucified. He knows things are getting ready to get real tough. So Jesus had his disciples, went to the garden, and he told them to pray. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his, his disciples, sit here while I go over there and do what? Pray. Here's Jesus giving us the example to talk to the Father. You say, well, yeah, but he was Jesus. He was in the human form right here, too. But he's telling us to talk to the Father. I'm going to give you the example. And taking with, him, taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Picture Jesus in the garden knowing he's getting ready to go through one of the most incredibly bad deaths known to man. He began to be sorrowful and troubled, and he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Verse 39, And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, What's he doing? He's praying. To whom? The Father. He prayed saying, My Father, if it be possible. If it be possible. I think that's a great way to start your prayer after you've praised him and worshipped him. Father, if it's okay or if, it's, if this is possible, if this is good with you, I'm going to let my request be made known. And I'm going to thank you for whatever answer you give me. He fell on his face. He said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What cup? He was getting ready to go and hang on a cross and have the full wrath of God poured upon him. That's the cup he's talking about. He was going to bear the sins of every person that was, was, would ever be born. That's a big load, right? Here's the son of God praying to the father, if there's any other way to do this, Let's do it. That's Jesus praying that to the Father. That's Him telling me it's okay to come before the Father and ask for whatever I need to ask for. That's how I read it. Knowing what He's about to face, God's wrath for all mankind, He asks this. If you're willing, if you're willing, and that's how we need to pray. We need to understand and be able to pray, but Lord, nevertheless, not my will. Now, there are prosperity preachers and there are faith healers that will tell you, never pray, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I've heard them say it. Because they're saying that's lack of faith. God wants you healed. It's His will. Well, then heal me, God. God wants you blessed. He wants you to have more than you can imagine. Well, then give it to me. I'm willing to accept it. And they say, but when we pray, nevertheless, then here, here goes our faith. That's just a little catchphrase, just in case I don't get it. I can say, well, then it must not have been God's will. Well, here's the bottom line. If I don't get it, apparently it wasn't God's will. But you know, sometimes we can work things out to happen that were not God's will. Buy that car that you can't afford. Uh, get off the cars, Brown, will you? I was going to go out and buy one this week. <laughs> I don't care. Make sure you can afford it. Make sure the little ones don't go without shoes. Or the big ones. The little ones are back there. Thinking about what the cross was about to bring, it's no wonder that Jesus prayed that prayer. Wow. Wow. Yet his prayer is perfect. Because he does say, and I encourage us to do this, Lord, here's what I want. 
but I want to honor you, so I want your will to be done. So if this is not your will, make it clear to me, and I'll leave it alone. I've prayed three times for you to remove it. And you've told me no because your grace is sufficient. I'm good with that. I'm content with that. Thank you, Lord. But pray, right? Jesus prayed. God knew what it was going to take for mankind to have their sins forgiven. His son, the only perfect lamb, was going to have to hang on this cross. He was going to have to shed his blood. God wasn't going to change that. But Jesus still prayed, if there's another way to do this, Father, can we do it? And then verse 44, so leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. For the third time, he prayed, if there's another way. Guess what? There wasn't another way. There was only one way for your sins to be forgiven. And that was for his son to hang on the cross. And that's why we get up here and talk about these things every week, so that we will point to Jesus. Not point to this preacher, not point to whatever preacher you look up to, but so that we point to Jesus. So in closing, we're instructed all throughout Scripture to pray, right? Yes or no? Yes. It's what the Scripture teaches. We can still have our hang-ups and our quirks, and you can still say, well, I'm not going to pray. Then don't. You have not because you ask not. And then some of you, you ask and you don't receive because you ask for all the wrong reasons. And God knows. So we trust Him. So we're instructed all throughout Scripture to pray. And I want to tell you, until God says no, until you get a very clear no, I'm going to encourage you to keep praying. Keep praying. Praising Him. Not getting frustrated that your prayer hasn't been answered. I hear about people all the time, I prayed for my husband for 25 years. And finally he came to know Christ. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Don't stop. Well, God knows who he's going to save and who he's not going to save. Guess when we'll talk about that? Next time. I want you here. That doesn't mean anything, does it? (laughs) Does that mean anything bad? Okay. Every now and then I'll make a sign or something, and I'm I'm told by the young people, well, you know what that means? (laughs) You know what that means? Oh, gosh, I can't remember. Here's what Bailey told you a couple months ago. Pray persistent prayers. Don't give up. Scripture teaches that. Pray God-centered prayers. God, we want your will be done. Yes, we want it to be to honor you. Yes, that's God-centered prayers. And pray specific prayers. Be specific. We serve a specific God, don't we? And then trust Him. But that's why we pray for people, because God's Word tells us to. Maybe you're not having because you're not asking. And maybe when you ask, you ask for the wrong reasons. And so... If I look at the Scripture, I can know what is not going to be in alignment with God's will. I don't have any money, so therefore I don't need to go in debt because he says the debtor is servant to the lender. And he doesn't want that for his people. Why? He wants us to have freedom. You can't serve somebody else. You can't help somebody else. You can't give to get somebody else out of the ditch if you don't have anything to give. Right? So anyway, let's bow our heads. By the way, as we talked about baptism last week, our baptism is going to be held on February the 2nd. We're going to do it right here. If you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to get signed up. It's an act of obedience. It's a great place to start. You say, well, I've been sprinkled. We talked about that last week. I want to encourage you to follow the Lord in obedience and be, excuse me, immersed. Why? Because that's the way God's Word tells us to do it. That's, that's the only answer I can give you on that. But as we are about to pray, as you get ready to pray, and I I read this somewhere this week and I jotted it down, and I think it's a great thing to do. As we are about to pray, for each prayer request, we should mentally or vocally ask this question. What possible reason do I have to think that God will answer this prayer? And many times that'll give you the answer as to whether to continue praying for that or not. 
Because there are a lot of things immediately, if we're honest with ourselves, God doesn't want us to have or to do or to be or whatever. And immediately the spirit within you, if you will be honest, will say no. You know that's totally against the will of God. What possible reason do I have to think that God will answer this prayer? We should be able to answer that question from his word, right? So that's why it's so important to know his word. I'm going to continue praying for you. And I hope you're continuing to pray for me and for this church. I'm going to continue to ask you to get on online and pray for the prayer request. And while I'm saying that, I want to encourage those of you, when you get the answer, when something happens with that request, please let us know. You know, it can be, and I don't say this to be funny, I say this to be truthful. It can be embarrassing when, you know, on your prayer request page, you've got this pray for so-and-so, they're sick. And -and so-and-so died three months ago. Let us know. You know, because if it's worth praying for, it's worth worshiping together with and about. Maybe so-and-so who knew the Lord went home to be with the Lord. That's something to celebrate. Maybe somebody who had cancer, now the cancer is gone. Let us celebrate with you on that. You asked us to pray about it. Can't we celebrate together over it? Maybe you're praying for something specific and you realize, I'm not going to get it. Let's celebrate together. I told you earlier, I do know one thing that's God's will for you through the Scripture. And And that is that you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I know there's some in here that probably don't know him. You've never placed your faith and your trust. You say you believe in God, and that's good. The Bible says that the demons believe and they tremble. So it must be just a little bit more than just having the head knowledge. And all through the Scripture, it talks about believing. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're saying that Jesus is more than just a man who walked the earth. He's God. He was God in the flesh, and now he's at the right hand of the Father. He's Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that takes faith, right? You didn't see it, I didn't see it, but I trust it. Then you'll be saved. It's that simple. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But when Peter talked about repentance, there will be a change. There will be a change. And that repentance is a change of mind. It says, now I want to go away from living for the world and I want to live for you, God. And then Jesus told us, as we read last week, that we're to make disciples, followers. We're to be pouring our life into other believers, new believers, so that they can grow and learn about the goodness of God and learn about his word and how to study and stuff. That's what we should all be doing. So my question is this, do you know him? If not, you can call upon him right now where you sit. Call upon him. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that God sent his Son to die on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven? Yes. Do you believe that they took Jesus down off the cross and they put him in a tomb? And the Bible says that on the third day that he got up and walked out of that tomb alive. Do you believe that? By faith, yes. Then call upon him and say, God, I believe. Save me. I believe. And if you're here today and you're a believer, you're a follower of Christ, but your life is not being lived to please God Almighty, tell him you're sorry. Lay the junk at his feet. Tell him to take it. I don't want it anymore. God, I want you in charge of my marriage. God, I want you in charge of my home life. God, I want you in charge of me as I go to school, that tough, hard place. God, I want you to lead me in my relationships. I want you to lead me in my decisions, financial decisions. I want you to lead me in all of these things because I want to bring glory and honor to you. Lord, help me to keep my mouth shut when it's time to keep my mouth shut. Lord, help me to not want what everybody else has got, but help me to want what you want 
for me. Help me to be content. And I'm telling you, it'll change your life. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I do thank you for your word. I do thank you, Father, that you've given us your word that we can read for ourselves, and you've given us the Holy Spirit within us to teach us and to guide us into what it means and how to apply it. I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would have a greater desire to know more about you and more about your word and to trust you and to serve you and to honor you. I pray, Lord, that this church would not be satisfied with just getting together on a Sunday morning, but that throughout the week our life would reflect you in our workplace, in our play place, in school, wherever we may be.